In a small, forgotten town nestled between dense woods and rolling hills stood an old Victorian mansion known as Maplewood House. The locals whispered tales of its sinister past, where shadows danced in the corners and strange noises echoed through the halls. It was said that the house was cursed, haunted by the spirits of its former inhabitants who met tragic ends within its decaying walls. Many dared each other to spend a night inside, but none returned with a clear mind, only haunted eyes and trembling voices. One chilly autumn evening, four friends, Sarah, Jake, Mia, and Tom, decided to challenge the town's superstitions. Eager for a thrill, they gathered flashlights, sleeping bags, and a video camera, determined to document their night in the infamous Maplewood House. As they approached the looming structure, the sun dipped below the horizon, casting eerie shadows on the overgrown lawn. The air was thick with an unsettling energy, but their youthful bravado pushed them forward. With a loud creak, they pushed the heavy front door open, revealing a dark, a dark and dusty foyer. The air smelled of mildew and decay. Welcome to our home for the night, Jake joked, trying to lighten the mood. They stepped inside, the door slamming shut behind them with a deafening bang. Startled, they exchanged nervous glances but shrugged it off. Setting up their camp in the grand living room, they began exploring the house. Portraits of stern-faced ancestors hung on the walls, their eyes seemingly following the group as they moved. What if they're watching us? Mia teased, but her voice shook with a hint of fear. They giggled, pushing their apprehension aside, but unease began to creep in. As night fell, the house transformed. The shadows grew longer, and the creaking of the floorboards sounded like whispers. Tom, ever the skeptic, dared the group to investigate the basement. Let's see if we can find any ghosts down there, he laughed, leading the way down the narrow staircase. The basement was dimly lit by a single flickering bulb, casting ominous shadows on the walls. Old furniture, covered in dust, loomed like forgotten specters. As they wandered deeper, they stumbled upon a dusty trunk. Curiosity peaked. They opened it to find an assortment of old letters, photographs, and a tattered diary. Mia gingerly picked up the diary, its pages yellowed with age. As she read aloud, the words sent chills down their spines. I fear for my life. He watches me from the shadows. I hear his whispers at night. The entries grew darker, describing a man who had tormented the author, leading to her tragic end. The friends exchanged worried glances, the atmosphere thickening with dread. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed from above, making them jump. Probably just the wind, Tom insisted, though he didn't sound convinced. They decided to head back upstairs, but as they ascended, they heard a soft sobbing sound coming from the hallway. Did you hear that? Sarah whispered, her voice barely above a breath. Let's check it out, Jake urged, trying to sound brave but failing to hide the tremor in his voice. They approached the source of the sound, their flashlights flickering as if the house itself was resisting their presence. As they turned the corner, they found a small girl standing at the end of the hall. She wore a white dress, her hair falling in tangled waves around her face. Tears streamed down her cheeks, and she looked lost and terrified. Help me, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Panicking, the friends froze. What do we do? Mia whispered, her eyes wide with fear. Maybe she needs us to help her find her parents, Sarah suggested, stepping forward hesitantly. As she approached the girl, the air turned icy, and the sobbing stopped. The girl's head snapped up, revealing hollow eyes that seemed to pierce through to their souls. You shouldn't have come here, she said, her voice now echoing with an otherworldly resonance. The walls of the hallway began to shake, and shadows twisted and writhed as if alive. In an instant, the girl vanished, leaving only a lingering chill in the air. Panic ensued, and the friends raced back to the living room, their hearts pounding. They gathered their belongings, adrenaline surging through them. We have to leave. Now! Jake shouted. But as they turned to flee, the door slammed shut with a force that rattled the house. Trapped, they looked around in horror as the shadows in the room deepened, swirling around them. The air became thick, suffocating, and the whispers grew louder, filling their ears with unintelligible murmurs. What do they want? Tom cried, his voice laced with fear. Suddenly, the lights flickered and went out, plunging them into darkness. The whispers transformed into anguished cries, echoing the despair of the house's tragic past. They huddled together, fear gripping their hearts. Just then, the fireplace roared to life, illuminating the room with a flickering glow. 
In the light, they saw faces in the flames, tormented souls crying out for help. The friends realized they were not just witnesses to a haunting. They were trapped in a cycle of suffering that the house had witnessed for decades. Desperate, they began pounding on the door, shouting for help. The sobbing returned, echoing in the room, but this time it was accompanied by laughter. Dark, sinister laughter that sent chills down their spines. You can't escape, the voices taunted. In a moment of clarity, Sarah remembered the diary. The girl, she was trying to warn us. With newfound determination, they returned to the basement, hoping to find answers. As they rummaged through the trunk, they discovered more letters, descriptions of the girl's tragic fate and the man who had tormented her. Realizing the key to their escape lay in understanding the past, they gathered the letters and began reading aloud, acknowledging the pain that had plagued the house for so long. As they recited the words, the whispers turned into cries of anguish, slowly fading into a mournful silence. With each word, the energy in the room shifted and the door creaked open. They bolted through the doorway, racing into the cool night air. As they stumbled onto the lawn, the house behind them seemed to sigh, the oppressive weight lifting. Breathless and shaken, they vowed never to speak of that night again, each carrying a piece of Maplewood House in their hearts. As they walked away, a faint whisper followed them. Thank you. The town never saw the four friends the same way again. They returned forever changed, haunted, not just by the events of that night, but by the weight of the stories etched into the walls of Maplewood House. Story number two. On the outskirts of a small town nestled between twisted pines and fog-laden hills stood Blackwood Manor, a crumbling relic of the 19th century. Locals whispered of its haunted past, warning anyone who dared venture too close. But for Rebecca, an intrepid vlogger with a passion for the supernatural, the manor was an irresistible challenge. One chilly October evening, Rebecca gathered her equipment, a flashlight, a camera, and a voice recorder. She parked her car at the foot of the long, winding driveway, the ancient oaks casting eerie shadows in the moonlight. With her heart racing in excitement and a tinge of fear, she approached the towering oak doors of the manor, which groaned in protest as she pushed them open. The interior was a desolate spectacle of decaying grandeur. Dust danced in the beam of her flashlight, illuminating the remnants of a once stately living room. Frayed drapes hung limply from cracked windows, and the air was thick with the scent of mildew and age. As Rebecca explored, her footsteps echoed like whispers of the past. She recorded her thoughts, sharing her excitement with her audience about what was to come. Welcome back to my channel, everyone. Today I'm at Blackwood Manor, known for its terrifying ghost stories. Legend has it that the original owner, Charles Blackwood, lost his family to a mysterious illness and never recovered from the tragedy. Locals say his spirit still wanders these halls, searching for his lost loved ones. As she spoke, a chill ran down her spine, but she brushed it off as mere nerves. Rebecca continued her exploration, wandering from room to room, each filled with the ghosts of memories long forgotten. It wasn't until she descended the creaking staircase to the basement that she truly felt the weight of the manor's sorrow. The basement was dark and cold, the air thickening with an unexplainable tension. As she turned on her flashlight, the beam fell upon dusty shelves lined with jars filled with murky liquid, remnants of long-forgotten experiments. A shiver ran through her as she caught sight of an old, ornate mirror leaning against the wall, its surface clouded with grime. Driven by curiosity, she approached the mirror, wiping away the dust with her sleeve. The reflection stared back, distorted and foggy, but as she leaned closer, the image flickered. For a brief moment, she saw not her own face, but a shadowy figure behind her, a woman in a white dress with hollow eyes. Rebecca spun around, heart pounding, but found nothing there, just the darkness of the basement. She chuckled nervously, rationalizing the vision as a trick of the light or her imagination playing games. Yet the feeling of being watched lingered. Ignoring her unease, she recorded the moment, assuring her viewers that it was all part of the experience. As she made her way back upstairs, Rebecca heard soft whispers echoing through the hallways. Help us. The voice was faint but clear, sending a jolt of fear through her. She froze, straining to hear, convinced it was just the wind. But the whispers grew louder, more insistent. Help us, please. Gripping her flashlight tightly, she followed the sound, her heart racing. 
The whispers led her to a small, dimly lit room at the end of a narrow corridor. As she stepped inside, she felt a sudden drop in temperature, her breath visible in the air. The room was empty except for a small, dusty cradle in the corner, the sight chilling her to the bone. Is anyone here? She called out, her voice shaking. The whispers ceased abruptly, replaced by an oppressive silence. Just as she turned to leave, the cradle began to rock on its own, creaking softly. Panic surged through her, but curiosity held her in place. She reached for the camera to capture the moment. But as she did, the lights flickered, plunging her into darkness. Rebecca's heart raced as she fumbled for her flashlight, a sense of dread washing over her. When the light finally returned, the room felt different, charged with an unseen energy. In the corner, she caught a glimpse of the shadowy figure again, now closer, its hollow eyes boring into her soul. Leave it whispered, its voice a haunting echo that reverberated through the room. Fear paralyzed Rebecca, her instincts screaming at her to flee. But the morbid curiosity that drove her to the manor kept her rooted to the spot. What do you want? She managed to ask, her voice barely above a whisper. Help us. The figure responded, extending a ghostly hand. Suddenly, the room filled with a cacophony of cries, the voices of children pleading for release. Rebecca stumbled back, her heart racing as she turned and fled the room, desperate to escape the horrors she had uncovered. As she dashed down the hallway, the shadows seemed to stretch and twist around her, chasing her with a malevolent energy. She stumbled back into the main hall, her breath coming in frantic gasps. The manor felt alive, every creak of the floorboards a reminder of the spirits that lingered. Her instincts kicked in, and she raced for the exit. As she reached the front door, it slammed shut before her, trapping her inside. Panic surged as she pounded on the door, pleading for it to open, but it held firm, as if the very walls of Blackwood Manor were determined to keep her there. Help us, the whispers echoed all around her, growing louder and more desperate. Rebecca sank to her knees, tears streaming down her face, consumed by a sense of helplessness. What do you want from me? She cried out, her voice breaking. Then, in the midst of the chaos, the room went silent. A figure materialized before her, the woman in white, her expression one of sorrow. Release us, she whispered, her voice barely audible. Rebecca felt an overwhelming sense of compassion wash over her. How? she asked, her voice trembling. The woman pointed toward the mirror, now glowing faintly with a strange light. Find the truth, she urged before fading into the darkness. Driven by a newfound determination, Rebecca scrambled to the mirror, realizing that it held the key to the manor's tragic past. As she traced her fingers over its surface, a vision flooded her mind. A tragic tale of love and loss, of Charles Blackwood and his family, lost to a terrible fate. With newfound resolve, Rebecca recorded a final message to her viewers, urging them to remember the souls trapped within the manor. I will find a way to help them, she vowed, her voice steady. As she spoke, the whispers began to fade, the energy in the room shifting as the spirits found solace in her words. Suddenly, the door burst open, allowing the moonlight to flood in. The shadows receded, and the oppressive weight of the manor lifted. Rebecca raced outside like the cool night air invigorating her spirit. She looked back at Blackwood Manor, knowing that while the ghosts still lingered, she had begun the process of freeing them. As she drove away, the whispers faded into the night, replaced by a sense of peace. Rebecca had come seeking a thrill, but had found something far more profound, a connection to the past and a promise to help the lost souls of Blackwood Manor find their way home. Story number three. It was a chilly autumn night in a small, forgotten town, nestled deep within the woods of New England. The townsfolk spoke of the old Whitmore estate, a decaying mansion that loomed over the landscape like a dark specter. Once a grand home, it had fallen into disrepair after the mysterious disappearance of its last owner, Eleanor Whitmore, a reclusive woman known for her eccentricities and rumored ties to the occult. As the wind howled through the trees, a group of adventurous teens dared each other to spend the night in the mansion. Among them was Sarah, an aspiring filmmaker who loved to document the supernatural. Armed with her camera and a flashlight, she led her friends, Mark, Lisa, Lisa, and Jake, through the rusted gates and up the overgrown path to the imposing front door. The entrance creaked open as they stepped inside, the air thick with the smell of mold and decay. Dust motes danced in the beam of Sarah's flashlight as they entered the grand foyer. 
Their laughter echoed through the empty halls, but, but the mansion seemed to absorb the sound, leaving a chilling silence in its wake. A portrait of Eleanor hung crookedly on the wall, her eyes seeming to follow them as they moved deeper into the house. Let's set up in the living room, Sarah suggested, eager to start her documentary. The others hesitated, glancing nervously at the dark corners of the room. But Sarah's enthusiasm was infectious, and soon they began exploring the mansion, taking videos and joking nervously about ghosts. As the night wore on, they settled in the living room, illuminated only by flickering candles they had brought with them. The atmosphere turned somber, and the initial thrill of being in the haunted house faded into an uneasy silence. Lisa, feeling the tension, proposed they play a game of truth or dare. I dare you to go upstairs and check out the master bedroom, Jake challenged Sarah, smirking. She hesitated but ultimately accepted the dare, determined to prove her courage. With the others watching, she ascended the creaky staircase, the floorboards groaning under her weight. When she reached the second floor, a chill ran down her spine. The dim light from her flashlight revealed long, dark hallways, and the air felt heavy, as if the house itself was holding its breath. She pushed open the door to the master bedroom, revealing a room frozen in time. The bed was still made, draped in a dust-covered sheet, and the furniture was shrouded in layers of grime. As Sarah moved to the window, she heard a soft whisper behind her, barely audible over the creaking house. Get out! She spun around, heart racing, but there was no one there. Just as she was about to convince herself it was her imagination, she noticed something odd. The closet door, slightly ajar, was moving as if someone or something was inside. A rush of adrenaline coursed through her veins as she approached the closet. It's just a draft, she whispered to herself, but the words felt hollow. She reached for the door and with a deep breath flung it open, empty, just coats hanging like shadowy figures. Relieved, she turned to leave, but as she did, she felt a cold hand grip her shoulder. Frozen with fear, she turned slowly. Nothing was there, yet the weight of a thousand eyes bore down on her. She stumbled back and dashed down the stairs, breathless and wide-eyed. Did you hear that? She gasped, her voice trembling. The others looked at her, confused and a little annoyed. Heard what? Mark asked. I don't know. Just let's stay together. They decided to regroup and huddle together on the couch, attempting to shake off the unease that clung to them. As they talked, shadows flickered in the corners of the room, growing longer and more defined. The whispers returned, echoing around them, and this time they were more pronounced, a haunting melody of voices chanting in unison, Leave. Now. Panic set in. This isn't funny, guys, Sarah shouted, her voice echoing against the walls. Are you messing with me? But the expressions on her friends' faces told her they weren't playing a prank. Suddenly, the lights flickered violently, plunging them into darkness. Screams erupted as they scrambled for their flashlights, the only source of safety in the enveloping gloom. We have to get out of here, Lisa shouted, her voice cracking with terror. They raced to the front door, but it wouldn't budge. It felt as if an unseen force was holding it shut, trapping them inside. The whispers grew louder, forming words that chilled them to the bone. You shouldn't have come here. Mark, filled with bravado, slammed his shoulder against the door in a desperate attempt to break free. Help me! he yelled. But just as he did, a deafening crash echoed from the hallway, and the air grew thick with an oppressive presence. Run! Sarah shouted, pushing past her friends as she dashed toward the kitchen, hoping to find another way out. The others followed, but shadows danced in the corners of her vision, and the temperature dropped. The whispers morphed into anguished cries, urging them to flee. In the kitchen, they found a back door, but it too was locked tight. As they frantically searched for a way to escape, the voices began to reveal the story of the house. She was never meant to leave, a voice whispered, echoing the tale of Eleanor Whitmore. The last descendant of a family cursed by greed and betrayal, Eleanor had vanished, leaving the estate to rot. Suddenly, the kitchen lights flickered back on, and they saw her, a ghostly figure standing in the doorway, eyes filled with sorrow. Eleanor's ethereal form beckoned them forward, a desperate plea etched on her pale face. Help me break the curse. In that moment, the door swung open on its own and the friends hesitated, torn between fear and compassion. They looked at one another, the understanding clear. They couldn't abandon a lost soul. Rushing back to the living room, 
They gathered their courage and began searching for clues to the curse. An old journal found hidden beneath the floorboards revealed Eleanor's tragic story. Betrayed by her own family, she had been trapped in the house, her spirit tied to the sorrow that permeated its walls. With newfound resolve, they joined hands in the center of the living room, forming a circle. Eleanor, Sarah called out, her voice strong. We're here to help you. We want to free you. The temperature in the room dropped further, and a cold wind swirled around them. As they recited a prayer from the journal, the room shook violently. Shadows twisted and writhed as the whispers turned to wails, an anguished chorus of lost souls. But as they continued, Eleanor's spirit grew brighter, and the oppressive darkness began to lift. In a final surge of energy, the room exploded with light, and then, silence. The shadows faded, and the air felt lighter, as if a great weight had been lifted. They opened their eyes, realizing they were no longer in the haunted mansion, but standing in a sunlit meadow, the Whitmore estate nowhere in sight. Exhausted but relieved, they exchanged incredulous looks. Did we really just experience that? Jake asked, still shaking. I think we did, Sarah replied, a small smile creeping onto her lips. And I think we freed her. As they walked back to their car, the sun setting behind them, they felt a sense of peace wash over them. The whispers had quieted, and the haunting presence of the mansion had vanished. But they also knew they would carry the memory of that night forever, a chilling reminder of the darkness they had faced and the light they had brought to a lost soul. Story number four. In the quaint town of Eldridge, nestled beside a sprawling forest, whispers of an ancient legend floated through the air like autumn leaves. It was said that a dark entity known only as the Watcher roamed the woods, preying on those who wandered too deep. Children were warned to stay close to home, and even the bravest adults tread lightly when dusk fell, for it was believed that the Watcher fed on fear, growing stronger with each terrified heart it encountered. One chilly October evening, a group of friends, Lily, Mark, Jess, and Eric, decided to test the old tales. Seeking a thrill, they packed flashlights, snacks, and an old camera ready to explore the depths of the woods. We'll prove there's nothing to be afraid of, Mark boasted, puffing out his chest with bravado. The others laughed, but an unease settled in their stomachs as they made their way toward the darkening tree line. As they ventured deeper, the sunlight waned, replaced by a thick canopy of gnarled branches. Shadows danced on the forest floor, and a chill crept into the air. Jess, always the superstitious one, suggested they turn back, but the boys convinced her to press on. They arrived at a clearing surrounded by towering trees, and they decided to set up camp. As the sun disappeared completely, the woods transformed into a symphony of eerie sounds. The rustling of leaves, the distant hooting of owls, and the soft whisper of the wind. They gathered around a small fire, laughter echoing through the trees, though an unspoken tension lingered in the air. Let's tell ghost stories, Eric suggested, and the group eagerly agreed. Each tale grew darker than the last, the forest seeming to listen intently. Finally, it was Jess's turn. She cleared her throat, her voice wavering as she began. They say the Watcher can sense fear. He watches from the trees, waiting for the moment to strike. Just then, a twig snapped behind them, silencing the group. They turned, peering into the darkness, but saw nothing. Probably just a deer, Mark said, though his bravado faltered. Hours passed and the fire dwindled to embers. Exhausted, they decided to settle in for the night. They set up their sleeping bags, but sleep was elusive. As the wind howled outside, Jess felt a prickle of unease. Guys, do you ever feel like we're being watched? She whispered, her heart racing. Stop being paranoid, Mark replied, though he couldn't shake the feeling himself. They huddled closer together trying to dispel the growing dread. Just then, a low growl echoed from the edge of the clearing. What was that? Lily gasped, her eyes wide with terror. I don't know, Eric said, rising to his feet. Stay here. I'll check it out. Are you crazy? Jess protested, but he was already moving toward the tree line, flashlight in hand. The beam sliced through the darkness, revealing nothing but shadows. The growling grew louder, a deep guttural sound that sent chills down their spines. Eric, come back, Lily cried, but he was already too far away, swallowed by the night. Minutes dragged on, each second feeling like an eternity. Just as they began to lose hope, Eric burst back into the clearing, panic etched across his face. It's out there, he gasped, breathless. We need to leave, now. Leave, but we can't just run into the woods. 
Jess argued, her voice trembling. It's coming closer, Eric shouted, glancing nervously over his shoulder. They could hear the sound of heavy footsteps, snapping branches, and the growl was closer now, echoing through the trees like a warning. With fear gripping their hearts, they scrambled to pack their things, the darkness closing in around them. Just as they were about to flee, the flashlight flickered and went out, uh, plunging them into darkness. Stay together, Mark yelled, his voice barely above a whisper as he reached for the others. They formed a tight circle, hearts racing, the oppressive weight of fear bearing down on them. Then they saw it. A pair of glowing eyes pierced the darkness, watching them from the shadows. The air grew cold, and the growling transformed into a menacing laughter that reverberated through the trees. The friends stood frozen, paralyzed by fear, as the figure stepped into the faint light of the dying fire. It was tall and gaunt, cloaked in darkness, its face obscured by shadows. You shouldn't have come here, it hissed, its voice like gravel sliding over stone. The eyes gleamed with an unnatural hunger, and the friends could feel the malevolence radiating from it. Run! Jess screamed, breaking the spell of fear that had gripped them. They turned and fled into the woods, branches clawing at their arms and legs as they stumbled through the underbrush. The sound of heavy footsteps followed closely behind, growing louder with every beat of their hearts. As they ran, the trees seemed to close in around them, twisting and turning like the very essence of nightmares. They darted left and right, desperate to find their way back to safety. Mark glanced back and saw the figure gaining on them, its glowing eyes fixed on him. Faster, he shouted, uh, pushing himself harder. They ran until their lungs burned, weaving through the trees, but the watcher was relentless. The laughter echoed in the darkness, growing closer, wrapping around them like a shroud. Finally, they burst through the tree line, emerging onto a familiar trail that led back to town. They sprinted down the path, not daring to look back the figure's laughter fading into the night. When they reached the safety of the streetlights, they collapsed, gasping for breath, hearts pounding in their chests. The darkness of the woods loomed behind them, and they dared not speak of what had just happened. From that night on, the friends carried the weight of their encounter with the Watcher. They never spoke of it again, but the fear lingered in their eyes whenever they passed the edge of the woods. The legend of the Watcher was real, and they knew the woods would never forget. The next time they ventured near, uh, they felt its gaze upon them, a reminder that some legends were born from truths that should never be tested. Story number five. In a quiet, unassuming town stood an old orphanage, abandoned for decades. Known as Hollow Hill Orphanage, it had been a home for lost children until a series of unexplained tragedies forced its closure. The townsfolk spoke of the place in hushed tones, warning curious souls that it was haunted by the spirits of those who had suffered within its walls. Despite the warnings, Alex, a local high school student with a penchant for the paranormal, decided it was the perfect location for his latest YouTube video. Armed with only a flashlight, a camera, and a sense of adventure, he set off one misty autumn evening to uncover the truth behind the rumors. As he approached the orphanage, the moonlight cast an eerie glow on the weathered facade. The paint was peeling and the windows were shattered, giving the place an ominous appearance. Taking a deep breath to steady his nerves, Alex pushed open the creaking gate and made his way up the overgrown path, the sound of crunching leaves echoing in the stillness. Inside, the air was heavy with dust and decay. Sunlight filtered through the broken windows, illuminating the remnants of childhood. Discarded toys, faded drawings, and rusted metal beds lined up in a dimly lit dormitory. Alex shivered, a feeling of sorrow washing over him as he surveyed the place that had once been filled with laughter. Welcome back to my channel, guys. Today, I'm at Hollow Hill Orphanage, a place shrouded in mystery and darkness, he announced, trying to maintain his bravado. They say the spirits of the children still roam these halls. Let's see if we can find any evidence of the paranormal. As he wandered deeper into the building, he felt a chill in the air as if someone was watching him. He brushed it off, chalking it up to his imagination. The peeling wallpaper and broken furniture painted a grim picture of the orphanage's past. Alex began filming, narrating his findings and sharing snippets of the ghost stories he had heard. In the main hall, he stumbled upon a dusty old piano. It was slightly out of tune but somehow beckoned him closer. With a mix of excitement and trepidation, he sat down and played a few notes. 
To his surprise, the sound echoed through the hall, stirring the silence like a long-forgotten memory. As he played, a soft melody began to weave through the air, mingling with his notes. Alex paused, confusion settling over him. Was he imagining things? He took a deep breath, dismissing it as a trick of the mind. But when he began to play again, the mysterious melody returned, sweeter and sadder than before. Suddenly, the temperature dropped, and Alex's breath fogged in the air. The hairs on the back of his neck stood up as he felt a presence behind him. He turned slowly, shining his flashlight into the darkness, revealing nothing but shadows. Heart pounding, he whispered, Is anyone here? A faint giggle echoed through the halls, chilling him to the bone. Hello? The voice drifted softly like a breeze through the broken windows. Alex's pulse quickened as he scrambled to find the source of the sound. Who's there? He called, his voice trembling slightly. A cold breeze swept through the room, ruffling his hair, and he caught a glimpse of a small figure darting around the corner. Driven by a mix of fear and curiosity, he followed the sound, his flashlight beam flickering nervously. The figure led him through a labyrinth of rooms until he found himself in a small nursery. The walls were adorned with faded murals of smiling children playing in a meadow. In the center of the room stood an old rocking horse, creaking gently as if someone had just dismounted. I see you, the voice whispered again, now clearer. I'm right here. Alex's heart raced as he spun around, but the room was empty. The whispers grew louder, swirling around him like a tempest. Help me, the voice pleaded. Please, who are you? Alex shouted, desperation creeping into his voice. What do you want? I'm lost, the voice sobbed, tinged with sorrow. I can't find my way home. The sadness in the voice pierced Alex's heart. How can I help you? He asked, the fear beginning to fade, replaced by compassion. Find my doll, the child's voice whispered, fading into a soft echo. It's in the attic. Determined to help, Alex ascended the creaking staircase, the wooden steps protesting beneath his weight. As he reached the attic door, he hesitated. The air was thick with dread, and a heavy silence enveloped him. Taking a deep breath, he pushed the door open. The attic was dark and cluttered, filled with dust-covered boxes and forgotten memories. Alex's flashlight swept across the room until it landed on a corner where a small, tattered doll lay half-buried beneath a pile of old clothes. Its button eyes glimmered in the flashlight's beam, and its frayed dress hung loosely, giving it an almost lifelike appearance. He approached the doll, feeling a strange pull toward it. Is this what you're looking for? He asked, holding it up. The temperature dropped again, and the air shimmered around him. The ghostly child appeared before him, her translucent form shimmering in the dim light. Yes, she cried, her voice filled with joy. Thank you. As Alex handed her the doll, he felt a warmth envelop the room, dispelling the oppressive atmosphere. The child's spirit smiled, her eyes sparkling with gratitude. You've helped me find my way home, she said softly. In that moment, Alex understood that the orphanage held not just sorrow, but also love and longing. The child took the doll and began to fade away, her spirit finally at peace. Thank you for remembering us, she whispered, her voice fading into the ether. With a heavy heart, Alex watched as the last traces of the spirit vanished. The oppressive weight that had filled the orphanage lifted, and he felt a sense of calm settle over him. He had entered the place seeking a thrill, but he left with a profound connection to the lost souls that lingered within its walls. As he made his way back outside, Alex turned to look at the orphanage one last time. He promised to share the story of the forgotten child and to honor the memories of those who had once called Hollow Hill Orphanage home. Sometimes, all it takes is a little kindness to help a lost soul find its way, he said softly to the camera, feeling the weight of the experience settle in his heart. He walked away from the orphanage, a renewed sense of purpose guiding him. Story number six. In a small town surrounded by dense forests and shadowy hills, there stood an old antique shop known as Gideon's Curiosities. It was a quaint little place filled with relics from another time, faded photographs, tarnished silverware, and odd trinkets that whispered secrets to those who dared to listen. But the most notorious item in the shop was a large, ornate mirror, framed in dark wood, its glass slightly clouded, reflecting not just images, but the essence of those who gazed into it. The townspeople spoke in hushed tones about the mirror, claiming it had a will of its own, capable of showing glimpses of the past and the future. They said it had once belonged to a powerful witch who had cursed it, 
trapping the souls of those who dared to look too long into its depths. Many believed that those who were drawn to the mirror never returned, their souls forever entwined within its glass. One evening, a young woman named Clara stumbled into Gideon's curiosities while escaping a sudden rainstorm. She was new to town, having moved to start a new life after a painful breakup. Clara was fascinated by the array of antiques, but felt an inexplicable pull towards the mirror. Its surface shimmered oddly, reflecting her image with an unsettling clarity. Don't get too close to that one, the shopkeeper, an elderly man named Mr. Gideon, warned, his voice gravelly with age. Many have looked into it, but not all have returned whole. Clara scoffed at the old tales, brushing them off as mere superstition. It's just a mirror, she replied, stepping closer, mesmerized by her reflection. She leaned in, her breath fogging the glass, and for a moment she saw a flicker of something, a shadow that moved behind her in the reflection. Startled, she stepped back, shaking her head as if to dispel the illusion. It's just my imagination, she thought. But the temptation to look again was overwhelming. She approached once more, and this time she saw not just her reflection, but a faint image of a young girl standing behind her, dressed in tattered clothes and with hollow eyes that seemed to plead for help. Hello? Clara whispered, her heart racing. The girl's lips moved silently, as if trying to communicate something important. The air around Clara grew cold and a sense of dread washed over her. Yet she couldn't tear her gaze away. Clara! Mr. Gideon's voice broke the spell. Step away from the mirror. You mustn't linger too long. But it was too late. Clara felt a sharp tug like an invisible hand gripping her heart. The girl's expression morphed from fear to desperation, and suddenly the mirror began to ripple, the surface shifting like water disturbed by a stone. Help me! The girl's voice echoed, a chilling sound that sent shivers down Clara's spine. Before she could react, a blinding light erupted from the mirror, engulfing her in a whirlwind of images and sounds. She saw glimpses of the girl's life. A time of laughter, then tragedy, and finally the dark shadows of despair. Clara screamed as the mirror's power pulled her closer, the reflection warping into a vortex. Mr. Gideon rushed forward, reaching for her, but the force was too strong. With a final gasp, Clara was sucked into the mirror, her body vanishing as if she had never existed. Inside the mirror, Clara found herself in a dark, twisted version of her reality. The air was thick and oppressive, filled with whispers that echoed around her. The girl stood before her, her eyes wide with fear and sorrow. Who are you? Clara asked, trembling. What do you want? I am Lily, the girl replied, her voice a haunting melody. I've been trapped here for so long. I was foolish like you. I thought I could see my future, like, but I ended up losing everything. Clara's heart raced as she began to understand. You were trapped in the mirror because you looked too long? Lily nodded, tears streaming down her pale cheeks. You must help me break the curse. Only then can we escape this place. Break the curse? How? Clara asked, her voice shaking. You have to face your fears, Lily whispered. The mirror feeds on regret and sorrow. You must confront what holds you back. Suddenly, images flooded Clara's mind, her failed relationship, the pain of betrayal, and the loneliness that had followed her. The mirror seemed to pulse with energy, drawing strength from her fears. Clara realized she couldn't let it consume her. I'm not afraid anymore, she said, her voice growing stronger. I refuse to be a prisoner of my past. As she spoke those words, a bright light emanated from her heart, illuminating the darkness around them. The mirror trembled, and Clara could feel Lily's presence beside her, a sense of shared strength rising between them. Together, Lily cried, we can break the curse. Clara reached out for Lily, and as their hands connected, a surge of energy erupted, shattering the dark confines of the mirror. The glass cracked and splintered, and a blinding light enveloped them both. In a flash, Clara found herself back in the antique shop, gasping for breath. She looked around, disoriented but alive. The mirror stood before her, now dull and lifeless, cracks spider-webbing across its surface. Mr. Gideon stood beside her, his face pale. You came back. You broke the curse, he whispered, awe and relief evident in his eyes. What happened to Lily? Clara asked urgently. She is free, Mr. Gideon replied softly. You freed her soul. Clara felt a wave of warmth wash over her. Though she had faced her fears and felt the weight of her past, she also felt a newfound sense of liberation. The mirror no longer held power over her. 
As she left the shop, the rain had stopped and the sun was beginning to set, casting a golden glow over the town. Clara walked with purpose, a smile on her lips, ready to embrace her new beginning. And deep within the cracked mirror, a faint reflection of a girl smiled back, no longer trapped, but finally free. Story number seven. In a small, forgotten town, tucked away between the dense woods and winding river, stood an old, dilapidated house. It had been abandoned for decades, its paint peeling and windows shattered, giving it a sinister aura. The townsfolk whispered about the house, sharing tales of the horrific events that had unfolded within its walls. They said it was haunted by the spirits of a family that had mysteriously vanished one fateful night. The Johnson family had lived there. David, the father, Sarah, the mother, and their two children, Lucy and Max. They were an ordinary family, or so everyone thought. But as the whispers grew louder, so did the darkness surrounding their home. One night, the townspeople heard a terrible scream echoing from the house, piercing through the stillness. When they rushed to the scene, they found the front door ajar, the interior cloaked in darkness. But there was no sign of the Johnsons. Days turned into weeks, and the family was never seen again. Eventually, the townspeople accepted the Johnsons' disappearance as just another dark tale of their town's history. Life went on, but the house remained, a haunting reminder of the past. Children dared each other to approach it, but no one ever ventured too close. Until one day, a group of teenagers, emboldened by their youthful bravado, decided to explore the abandoned house. They had heard the stories, but the thrill of adventure was too enticing to resist. Among them was Mike, the self-proclaimed leader of the group, and his friends, Emily, Jake, and Rachel. Armed with flashlights and an air of invincibility, they made their way to the creaking front door. The moment they stepped inside, a chill enveloped them. The air was thick with dust and the scent of decay. Shadows danced on the walls as their flashlights flickered. Let's split up and explore, Mike suggested, eager to prove his bravery. Reluctantly, the group agreed. As they wandered through the house, they encountered rooms filled with forgotten relics. Old toys, photographs, and furniture draped in white sheets. But it was in the upstairs hallway that they felt a sudden change. The atmosphere grew heavier, and the temperature dropped significantly. I don't like this, Rachel whispered, her voice trembling. Come on, it's just an old house, Jake replied, trying to maintain the group's courage. But as they turned to leave, a faint whisper echoed through the hallway, chilling them to the bone. Get out! They froze, exchanging uneasy glances. Did you hear that? Emily gasped. Just the wind, Mike insisted, though he too felt an unsettling dread creeping in. He took a step forward, the floorboards creaking beneath him. Suddenly, the door to one of the rooms swung open violently, slamming against the wall. Panic ensued. They rushed to the door, their hearts racing, and decided it was time to leave. But as they turned to flee, they found themselves facing a figure standing at the end of the hallway, a shadowy outline barely discernible in the dim light. What is that? Rachel screamed, her voice filled with terror. The figure remained still, its eyes glowing like embers in the darkness. In that moment, the room grew colder and the whispers intensified, merging into a cacophony of voices that echoed around them. Help us, find us, run. Mike shouted, pushing everyone towards the staircase. As they rushed down, the whispers grew louder and the shadow began to move, gliding towards them with an unnatural grace. They burst through the front door and stumbled outside, gasping for breath. The night air felt suffocating as they raced towards the safety of the streetlights. Once they reached the road, they turned to look back at the house. To their horror, they saw the shadow standing at the window, watching them with a sinister gaze. Let's get out of here, Jake urged, his face pale. They sprinted down the road, not stopping until they reached the diner at the edge of town. Breathless and trembling, they recounted their harrowing experience to the waitress, who listened intently, her face growing pale. You should have never gone there, she warned. The Johnsons, they didn't just vanish, they were taken. That house is cursed. People who enter rarely come back the same. Some never come back at all. The group exchanged fearful glances, their minds racing with questions but they couldn't shake the feeling that something had followed them from the house. That night, as they tried to sleep, whispers lingered in their minds, haunting their dreams. They could hear the desperate cries of the Johnson family echoing through their thoughts. Days turned into weeks, but the shadows of that night 
never left them. Each of them began experiencing strange occurrences, objects moving on their own, glimpses of figures in the corners of their eyes, and those relentless whispers that seemed to call their names. Rachel was the first to break. She had taken to avoiding her friends, overwhelmed by the shadows that lingered in her mind. One night, she could take it no longer. Driven by an unexplainable urge, she returned to the house alone. As she stepped inside, the air felt electric, charged with a dark energy that wrapped around her like a shroud. Help us. Find us. The voices beckoned, growing stronger as she ventured deeper into the house. The shadows danced around her, coiling and twisting as if trying to pull her into their depths. Who are you? Rachel cried out, her voice trembling. What do you want? Suddenly the room shifted, revealing a flash of memories, visions of the Johnson family, uh, trapped in their last moments. Their faces twisted in fear and despair. They were reaching out to her, desperate for help. But then the darkness engulfed her, and she felt herself slipping away, lost in the shadows. Meanwhile, back in town, the remaining friends felt an overwhelming sense of dread. When Rachel didn't return, they realized they had to confront their fears. Together, they returned to the house, their hearts racing. As they entered, the whispers grew louder, echoing through the halls like a twisted symphony. Rachel, they called, but there was no answer. The shadows shifted, swirling around them as they pushed deeper into the house, desperate to find their friend. In the upstairs hallway, they saw it. The shadowy figure they had encountered before, now more defined and terrifying. Leave now, it hissed, its voice echoing with a chilling finality. But they pressed on, driven by a mix of fear and determination. In a nearby room, they found Rachel, her eyes wide with terror, staring at something beyond the veil of darkness. Help us. Find us. The voices called again, and they felt the pull of the spirits, the desperate longing of the Johnsons for someone to save them from their eternal torment. Suddenly, the house trembled, and the shadows began to close in, threatening to swallow them whole. In that moment, Mike stepped forward, clutching Rachel's hand tightly. We can't leave them, he said, determination filling his voice. We have to help them find peace. The group formed a circle, holding hands as they focused on the light within them. We're here to help you, they shouted, their voices united against the darkness. We will find you. As their voices rang out, the shadows recoiled, the whispering growing frantic. The air became charged with energy, and the darkness began to unravel, revealing the ghostly figures of the Johnson family. Thank you, they whispered, their faces softening as they stepped forward, their hands reaching for the group. And just like that, the darkness lifted, the spirits of the Johnson family breaking free from their torment. The house sighed as if it had been released from a heavy burden, and the light returned, illuminating the once shadowy corners. But as the light faded, the friends found themselves standing alone in the now quiet house. The whispers were gone, but the weight of their experience lingered. They had faced the horrors of that night and emerged changed, bound by the secrets they had uncovered. As they left the house, they turned for one last look. It stood in silence, a testament to the past, a reminder that some stories linger long after the last page is turned, and somewhere in the echoes of the woods, the whispers faded into the night, the spirits finally at peace. Story number eight. In the heart of a small, secluded town, there stood an old, decrepit house known to locals as the Grayson House. Once a vibrant family home, it had been abandoned for years after a series of mysterious events led to the disappearance of its last occupant, a reclusive woman named Eliza Grayson. Rumors swirled around the town, claiming that Eliza had made a pact with dark forces and that her spirit still roamed the halls, seeking vengeance on those who disturbed her rest. Despite the ominous tales, a group of friends, Tom, Sarah, and Jake, decided to explore the Grayson house on Halloween night. They were thrill-seekers, drawn by the excitement of confronting the supernatural and armed with flashlights and their phones to document their adventure. As they approached the house, the moon hung low in the sky, casting an eerie glow over the weathered structure. The wind howled, sending shivers down their spines as they pushed open the creaking front door. Dust motes danced in the air and the musty scent of decay filled their nostrils. Welcome to the haunted Grayson house, Tom announced, attempting to keep the mood light. Let's see if we can find Eliza. They entered the main hallway, adorned with faded wallpaper and peeling paint. 
As they explored, the group stumbled upon a dilapidated living room filled with old furniture draped in white sheets, as if the house itself was in mourning. Look at this place, Sarah said, pulling back one of the sheets to reveal an ornate armchair. It's like a time capsule. Yeah, a time capsule that's about to give us all nightmares, Jake joked, trying to lighten the mood. But as he spoke, the atmosphere shifted. The air grew colder and a palpable tension hung over them. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed from the upstairs. They all jumped, exchanging nervous glances. What was that? Sarah whispered, her voice trembling. Probably just the wind, Tom said, though he didn't sound convinced. Let's check it out. With their flashlights illuminating the dark staircase, they made their way up. Each step creaked under their weight, and the further they ascended, the more oppressive the atmosphere became. A feeling of dread settled over them, and whispers began to swirl through the air, faint and unintelligible. At the top of the stairs, they found themselves in a long hallway lined with closed doors. The whispers grew louder, and a chill swept through the corridor, making the hairs on the back of their necks stand on end. Do you hear that? Jake asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Yeah, Sarah replied, glancing nervously at the doors. It's like someone's calling us. Just then, a door at the end of the hall creaked open slowly, revealing a dimly lit room. A sense of foreboding washed over them, but curiosity won out. They approached the room, the whispers intensifying as they crossed the threshold. Inside, they found a bedroom frozen in time. An old four-poster bed sat in the center, its covers neatly arranged, as if waiting for its occupant to return. The walls were lined with dusty photographs, and one in particular caught Sarah's attention. It was a picture of Eliza, her piercing gaze seemingly following them. Look at this, Sarah said, pointing to the photo. She looks sad. As she said this, the room grew darker, the temperature plummeting. Tom aimed his flashlight at the window only to find it tightly shut as if it had been sealed for years. Panic set in and they all felt an urge to leave. Maybe we should go back, Jake suggested, glancing uneasily at the door. But before they could move, the door slammed shut with a deafening bang. They spun around, their hearts racing. The whispers became a chorus of urgent voices echoing around them. Get out! Leave now! Open the door! Tom yelled, banging on it in a panic. Let us out! Suddenly, the lights flickered and went out, plunging them into darkness. The only illumination came from their flashlights, which flickered ominously. The whispers morphed into a single voice, chilling and filled with anger. You should not have come here. Who are you? Sarah shouted, fear gripping her throat. What do you want from us? There was a moment of silence, and then the air grew thick with sorrow. You have disturbed my rest. The voice replied, its tone shifting from anger to despair. I am trapped in this house, bound by the pain of my past. Your past? Jake asked, his voice quivering. What happened to you? I was betrayed, the voice lamented. The townsfolk turned against me, were fueled by fear and ignorance. They took everything from me, and now I am forever alone. As the voice spoke, the temperature dropped further, and a ghostly figure began to materialize before them. Eliza Grayson stood there, her form translucent and ethereal, eyes filled with sorrow. I only wanted to protect the children, she whispered, her voice echoing through the room, but they feared what they did not understand. Tom, feeling a surge of compassion, took a step forward. We didn't come to hurt you. We want to understand what happened. Eliza's gaze softened and the oppressive atmosphere began to lift. If you wish to help me, you must uncover the truth. The townspeople buried my story along with my body. Show them I am not a monster. Determined to free Eliza's spirit, the friends agreed. They began to dig into the history of the Grayson house, spending days interviewing locals and researching the town's archives. What they uncovered was a story of fear, misunderstanding, and betrayal. Eliza had been a kind-hearted woman who cared for orphan children, providing them with love and shelter. But when a series of unfortunate accidents occurred in the town, fires, illnesses, the blame fell on her. Accusations of witchcraft and dark magic swirled, leading to her eventual demise. Armed with this knowledge, the friends returned to the house on a stormy night, ready to confront the town and clear Eliza's name. They set up their cameras and recorded their findings, detailing the truth behind the tragic events that led to Eliza's haunting. As the storm raged outside, they broadcast their video live, hoping to reach the townspeople. They implored everyone to listen. 
to understand that Eliza had been a victim of fear and prejudice. Join us in bringing the truth to light, Tom urged, looking directly into the camera. Eliza deserves to be remembered, not feared. As the live stream ended, the atmosphere in the house shifted again. The air felt lighter and Eliza's spirit appeared before them once more, gratitude radiating from her ethereal form. Thank you, she whispered, her voice now warm and soothing. You have given me hope. With that, the lights flickered and a radiant glow filled the room. The weight of the house began to lift and Eliza smiled, her form becoming less transparent. I can finally rest, she said softly. You have freed me. As Eliza's spirit ascended, the friends felt a wave of relief wash over them. The oppressive darkness that had hung over the Grayson house lifted, and they knew they had fulfilled their promise to help. In the days that followed, the town rallied together, acknowledging the truth of Eliza's story. The Grayson house was transformed into a memorial, honoring the children and the woman who had cared for them. Tom, Sarah, and Jake watched from a distance as the town began to heal, the memory of Eliza Grayson finally shining in the light of understanding. Sometimes, Sarah said, looking at her friends, it takes courage to face the past, but the truth always finds a way to set us free. And with that, the haunted whispers of the Grayson house faded into a gentle breeze, leaving behind a legacy of love and redemption. Story number nine. In the heart of a bustling city, nestled between tall buildings and busy streets, there was an old, unassuming apartment complex known as Hawthorne Manor. It had a reputation for being haunted, though most of the residents dismissed the stories as urban legends. But for one young woman, Mia, who had just moved in, the tales took on a chilling reality. Mia was a college student who had relocated for her studies. Excited about her new life in the city, she signed the lease without a second thought, unfazed by the whispers of ghosts and shadows. Her apartment was small but cozy, adorned with vintage furniture she had picked up at thrift stores. But from the moment she settled in, she felt an unusual energy in the place, a lingering heaviness that she couldn't quite place. The first night in her new home, Mia couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. As she lay in bed, staring at the ceiling, she heard soft creaks echoing through the walls as if the house were breathing. Shaking off her unease, she dismissed it as the building settling. However, as the days passed, the feeling of being watched only intensified. Strange occurrences began to plague her. Lights flickered when no one was home, shadows danced at the edges of her vision, and she often awoke to the sound of soft whispers as if conversations were happening just beyond her grasp. One night as she prepared for bed, Mia noticed that her closet door was slightly ajar. She could have sworn she had closed it earlier, but she shrugged it off as a trick of her imagination. However, as she climbed into bed, she felt an inexplicable urge to check beneath it. With a racing heart, she leaned down, peering into the darkness beneath her bed. Nothing. But that night, sleep eluded her. She tossed and turned, every creak of the building amplifying her anxiety. Just as she began to drift off, she felt something cold brush against her ankle. Startled, Mia shot up, heart pounding, and scanned the room. The shadows appeared deeper, more pronounced, and she felt a chilling presence in the air. Just my imagination, she whispered to herself but deep down she sensed it was more than that. As the weeks went on, Mia grew increasingly paranoid. The shadows seemed to shift in the corners of her apartment and she felt a growing sense of dread. One evening, while studying at her desk, she caught a glimpse of a figure in the reflection of her computer screen, an indistinct shape darting just out of view. Panic surged through her and she quickly turned, but nothing was there. Determined to confront her fears, Mia decided to research the history of Hawthorne Manor. In the dim light of her living room, she discovered that, that the building had once been a boarding house in the 1920s. Rumors circulated about a tenant named Clara, a young woman who had mysteriously disappeared without a trace. Some said she had been seen wandering the halls, her spirit trapped in the very walls of the manor. As she read about Clara's tragic fate, Mia felt a chill wash over her. The stories matched the sensations she had experienced. Is Clara trying to communicate with me? She wondered, her mind racing. That night, she resolved to confront the spirit. After a long day of classes, Mia prepared for the night ahead. She gathered candles, a notebook, and a small flashlight, setting up in the living room. 
Clara, she called out softly, her voice steady despite the pounding of her heart. If you're here, I want to help you. For a moment, nothing happened. Then the lights flickered and the room grew cold. A whisper floated through the air, barely audible. Help me. Mia's pulse quickened. What do you need? How can I help you? She asked, feeling a surge of courage. The shadows in the room thickened, swirling around her as the whispers intensified. Beneath the bed came the faint reply, echoing like a distant memory. Nervously, Mia made her way to her bedroom, her heart racing. She knelt beside the bed, breathing deeply, and took hold of the bed frame, preparing to look beneath once more. As she leaned down, she felt a rush of air, cold and unsettling, wrapping around her like a shroud. This time, she saw it, a dark, shadowy figure lurking in the corner beneath the bed. Its eyes glowed faintly, a soft luminescence that seemed to beckon her. Fear coursed through her veins, but she was determined. Clara, is that you? The figure shifted, its form becoming clearer. It was a woman, her face pale and sorrowful, trapped in an expression of longing. Help me, find my rest, she whispered, her voice echoing with despair. Mia's heart ached for the spirit. I will help you. Tell me what happened to you, she pleaded. The shadows swirled around the figure, and suddenly, visions flashed before Mia's eyes. Memories of Clara's life, the laughter of friends, the hope of love, and then darkness, an argument, a struggle, and then silence. Mia gasped as she witnessed the terrible truth. Clara had been betrayed by someone she trusted, her life cut short in the very apartment where Mia now lived. Mia felt a rush of anger and sadness for the lost soul. I will find out what happened to you. You deserve peace, she vowed, feeling an unbreakable connection to Clara. Determined, Mia spent the next few days investigating, digging through old records, newspapers, and speaking to neighbors who had lived in the building long ago. She learned of Clara's tragic story. The young woman had been engaged to a man named Victor, who had grown jealous and possessive. One fateful night, an argument had escalated, and in a fit of rage, he had pushed her causing her to fall, fatally injuring her. Victor vanished after that night, leaving Clara's fate a haunting mystery. With newfound resolve, Mia returned to her apartment, armed with the truth. Clara, I know what happened. You were betrayed, but you are not forgotten, she spoke, lighting candles around her room, creating a circle of warmth and light. As the candles flickered, the temperature in the room dropped. The shadows began to swirl, coalescing into the figure of Clara once more. Thank you. She whispered, her voice a soft melody. I want to help you find peace, Mia said earnestly. You don't have to be alone anymore. The spirit nodded, a flicker of hope illuminating her hollow eyes. Release me, she pleaded. Help me find Victor. Mia understood. I will, I promise. With that, she made a plan. Mia knew that the only way to help Clara find peace was to confront Victor, to ensure that he faced the consequences of his actions. She contacted the local authorities, providing them with the information she had gathered. It wasn't long before they tracked down Victor, now an old man living in another state, burdened by the weight of his past. As the police brought him in for questioning, Mia stood outside, her heart racing. She felt a surge of energy, as if Clara was standing beside her, urging her on. When Victor arrived at the station, his face was a mask of confusion. Mia stepped forward, her voice steady. You need to answer for what you did to Clara, she declared, feeling the weight of the moment settle over her. Victor's face turned pale, recognition dawning in his eyes. I didn't mean to hurt her, he stammered, his voice trembling. It was an accident. Mia felt the rage bubbling inside her. You took her life. You have to face what you did. As Victor stood before the officers, the shadows around Mia began to shift, swirling with energy. Suddenly, she felt a warm presence envelop her, and she knew Clara was there, guiding her. Mia watched as Victor was led away, and she felt a wave of relief wash over her. Clara was finally being recognized, her story no longer a haunting mystery. That night, back in her apartment, Mia lit candles and sat on the floor, feeling a profound connection to the spirit. You're free now, Clara. You can rest, she whispered, closing her eyes. In that moment, a gentle breeze swept through the room, and the shadows began to fade. The air grew lighter, and Mia felt a sense of peace wash over her. She knew Clara was finally at peace, no longer trapped by the pain of her past. As the last flicker of candlelight dimmed, Mia settled into bed, feeling a warmth surround her. She smiled, knowing that the shadows beneath her bed had been lifted, and the spirit of Clara would forever remain in her heart. 
Story number 10. In the heart of a dense forest lay a village known as Black Hollow. The village was small, but it was rich with history and secrets. Many believed that the forest surrounding it was cursed, as anyone who ventured too deep would often vanish without a trace. Despite the warnings, there were always a few thrill-seekers eager to test their courage against the tales that had haunted the villagers for generations. One autumn evening, a group of five friends, Liam, Sophie, Ben, Mia, and Jack, decided to explore the legendary forest of Black Hollow. They had heard the chilling stories, but nothing could deter their adventurous spirits. With flashlights in hand and an air of bravado, they set off into the woods, laughter echoing in the stillness. As they walked deeper into the forest, the trees loomed tall and menacing, their gnarled branches twisting like skeletal fingers. The sun began to set, casting eerie shadows on the ground. They stumbled upon an old, crumbling sign that read, Beware, Lost Souls Ahead. The group laughed, dismissing it as mere folklore, and pressed on. After a while, they reached a clearing where an ancient stone well stood, half hidden by overgrown weeds. The well appeared to be the centerpiece of a long-forgotten settlement. Settlement. Curious, they approached it, peering into its dark depths. The air grew noticeably colder, and an uneasy feeling settled over them. I dare someone to toss a rock in, Ben challenged, trying to lighten the mood. I'll do it, Jack said, scoffing at the fear creeping in. He picked up a small stone and threw it in the well. As the sound of the stone echoed in the depths, a sudden gust of wind swept through the clearing, extinguishing their flashlights. Great job, Jack! Mia exclaimed sarcastically, her voice trembling slightly. Let's just turn them back on, Liam suggested, fumbling with the flashlight. They clicked them on, but only a dim flicker remained. The group huddled closer, unease thick in the air. Suddenly, they heard a soft whisper, barely audible at first. Help us! Help us! It came from the direction of the well, sending shivers down their spines. Did you guys hear that? Sophie whispered, her eyes wide. Probably just the wind, Liam replied, though his voice lacked conviction. The whispers grew louder, blending together like a mournful chorus. Help us! Find us! Fear began to grip the group as the shadows around them seemed to darken. We should go, Mia insisted, her heart racing. But before they could turn to leave, the ground beneath them trembled, and the well erupted with a blinding light. The friends shielded their eyes, and when they looked back, they saw figures emerging from the depths, pale, translucent silhouettes with hollow eyes filled with sorrow. Who are you? Jack shouted, his bravado fading fast. Forgotten souls, one of the figures replied, its voice echoing with despair. Trapped in this cursed place, we need your help to break free. Liam took a step back, shaking his head. No way, this can't be real. The figures floated closer, their faces twisted in anguish. We were once like you, full of life, but we ventured too far into the forest and now we are lost. Help us remember who we were. The friends exchanged terrified glances, their earlier bravado completely vanished. What do you want us to do? Sophie asked, her voice quivering. Gather our belongings, return them to our families, the spirits pleaded. Only then can we find peace. No, Ben shouted. This is insane. We can't help them. Suddenly, the ground shook again, and the figures wailed, their voices rising in a cacophony of despair. You must help us. You must face the darkness that took us. As the forest darkened around them, the friends felt an overwhelming urge to flee. They turned to run, but the whispers became deafening, echoing through their minds, urging them to stay. In a panic, they dashed through the trees, branches clawing at their clothes as they ran. Split up, Liam shouted, desperate to escape the haunting voices. They scattered into the darkness, each consumed by fear and uncertainty. Sophie ran deeper into the woods, her heart pounding in her chest. As she stumbled through the underbrush, she heard the whispers again, this time more personal, calling her name. Sophie? Sophie. She stopped, catching her breath, only to find herself surrounded by thick fog. The silhouettes materialized before her, their faces now clear. They looked familiar, people she had known, friends and family long gone. Help us, they pleaded, their voices breaking. No, I can't, Sophie cried, backing away. But as she turned, the forest twisted and warped, leading her further into the abyss. Meanwhile, Ben found himself trapped in a circle of trees that seemed to close in on him. The air grew thick and oppressive, and he could hear the whispers all around. You have something of ours, they hissed, and he felt a sudden chill run down his spine. 
Get away from me, he screamed, trying to push through the thickening shadows. But the figures loomed closer, their expressions now more desperate. Return what you've taken. Liam ran blindly through the forest, his flashlight flickering erratically. He could feel the spirits pressing in, their presence suffocating. He stumbled upon a small clearing filled with old toys, mementos, and photographs, the remnants of lost lives. In that moment, he realized what he needed to do. The items must belong to the forgotten souls. Gathering the courage, he picked up a worn teddy bear and a rusted bicycle bell, feeling their energy resonate with the whispers. I'll help you, he shouted into the darkness. But the shadows roared in fury and the ground trembled violently. The spirits cried out, their voices a mix of hope and desperation. You must return them to the village. Realizing that time was running out, Liam made his way back to the others. He found Mia, who was frantically searching for Jack. We have to return to the village, he yelled, clutching the items tightly. Together, they raced through the forest, the darkness closing in around them. Finally, they burst into the clearing where they had first encountered the well. The figures were waiting, their faces etched with longing. We can't stay here, Mia panted. We need to go. Please, the spirits pleaded, their voices softening. Return our belongings to our families. Only then will we be free. Liam stepped forward, holding out the items. We promise, he said, his voice steady despite the fear coursing through him. We'll do it. The shadows flickered, and for a brief moment, the spirits appeared almost serene. They reached out, touching the items with translucent hands. Thank you, they whispered, their voices echoing in unison. As the last words faded, the forest shuddered and the darkness lifted. The spirits smiled, their faces glowing with gratitude as they slowly faded away into the mist, finally free from their torment. In the aftermath, the friends emerged from the forest, forever changed by the experience. They returned to the village where they found the families of the lost souls. With heavy hearts, they shared the story, returning the items and honoring those who had been forgotten. As they left Black Hollow, the shadows of the forest seemed to retreat, a promise of peace finally restored. But in the quiet of the night, the whispers lingered on the wind, a reminder of the souls they had helped find their way home. Story number 11. In a small forgotten town nestled between rolling hills and thick woods, there existed a train station that had long since fallen into disrepair. The Black Hollow Station was a relic of a bygone era, its rusted tracks overtaken by weeds, the paint on the station house peeling away like old memories. It had been years since a train had rolled through, but the townsfolk still whispered about the eerie happenings that occurred there. Legend had it that on stormy nights, a ghostly train would glide silently into the station, carrying passengers who had not made it to their final destinations. They spoke of the last train, a spectral locomotive that appeared only to those who were lost in life, those burdened by regrets, fears, or unfinished business. On a particularly stormy evening, a young woman named Lily found herself wandering down the overgrown path leading to the station. She had recently experienced a devastating breakup, and the weight of her heartbreak felt heavier than the rain-soaked air around her. Drawn by a strange compulsion, she sought solace in the abandoned station, hoping to find some clarity in her turmoil. As she arrived, the wind howled through the trees, creating an unsettling melody that sent shivers down her spine. The station was dark and foreboding, but Lily stepped inside, her footsteps echoing against the cracked tiles. Dust motes floated in the dim light filtering through the broken windows. Why am I here? She whispered to herself, her voice barely audible over the sound of the rain beating against the roof. She felt an inexplicable pull toward the platform, as if the very essence of the station was calling her. Lily approached the edge of the platform and gazed into the darkness beyond the tracks. The storm intensified, thunder rumbling ominously overhead. Just as she considered leaving, a distant whistle pierced the air, sending a jolt of adrenaline through her. Before she could react, a light appeared on the horizon, growing brighter as it approached. The ground trembled beneath her feet, and Lily's heart raced as she realized the source of the sound was a train, a ghostly locomotive shrouded in mist, gliding silently down the tracks. Panic and curiosity warred within her. She had heard the stories, but she never truly believed them. Yet here it was, the last train coming for her. The train slowed, and the whistle echoed once more, resonating deep in her chest. 
The doors of the closest car swung open, inviting her in. What choice did she have? With a deep breath, Lily stepped aboard, the air inside heavy with a, a scent of must and something sweet, like old memories. As she entered, she found the car eerily beautiful, decorated with faded velvet seats and flickering gas lamps that cast a soft glow. The car was empty except for one solitary figure sitting at the far end, a man in a worn suit, his eyes downcast. He looked up as Lily entered, revealing a kind yet sorrowful expression. Welcome aboard, he said softly. I didn't expect any passengers tonight. Is this, is this the last train? Lily stammered, still in disbelief. It is, the man replied, nodding slowly. Many come aboard to find closure, to confront the choices they've made. His gaze seemed to pierce through her, and she felt exposed, her heart laid bare before him. What does that mean? Lily asked, her voice trembling. Closure from what? The regrets you carry, the pain that binds you. You've come seeking something, haven't you? His eyes softened and she could feel his compassion enveloping her. Lily felt a lump form in her throat. I'm lost. I thought I'd find clarity, but I don't know what to do anymore. I feel like I've failed, in love and in life. The man leaned forward, his expression earnest. This train takes you to where you need to go, to confront your past and embrace your future. But you must choose to face what you've been running from. With a sudden jolt, the train lurched forward, the rhythmic clatter of wheels against the tracks creating a hypnotic melody. The scenery outside the windows transformed, shifting between dark woods and bright memories from Lily's life. Images flashed by her childhood home, her friends laughing, the moment she met her ex, their smiles, their love. But as the memories flowed, they began to morph into shadows, arguments, heartbreak, and tears. The train picked up speed and she felt her heart race. No! Lily cried out, clutching the seat. I can't face this. The man's voice cut through her panic. You must. It's the only way to find peace. Suddenly, the train screeched to a halt, the darkness closing in around them. The man gestured for her to look out the window. They had arrived at a station, but it was unlike any she had seen before. The platform was bathed in an otherworldly light, and people milled about, some laughing, others crying. It felt alive, yet haunted. As she stepped off the train, she realized she was in a memory, a moment she had tried to forget. She saw herself standing on the platform, arguing with her ex, the pain and regret palpable in the air. She had walked away that day, convinced she was making the right choice, but the weight of that decision had lingered ever since. Why did I walk away? She whispered, tears streaming down her face. Only you can answer that, the man said gently. What do you wish you had done differently? In that moment, the fog of her heartbreak began to lift. Lily remembered the love they had shared, the laughter, the dreams they once had. But she also recalled the moments of hurt, the ways they had grown apart. Understanding dawned upon her. The choices they made, both good and bad, shaped who she was. I was scared, she said finally, her voice steady. I thought leaving would protect me from pain, but I only caused more hurt. Embrace that truth, the man urged. Let it go. You cannot change the past, but you can choose to learn from it. With newfound clarity, Lily took a deep breath, allowing the memories to wash over her without fear. The shadows faded, replaced by light and understanding. The station before her transformed, revealing a beautiful scene, people reuniting, joy and laughter echoing all around. Lily turned to the man, her heart full. Thank you, she said, her voice trembling with gratitude. I understand now I can't keep running from my choices. He smiled, his presence warm and reassuring. You're ready to move forward to let go of what weighs you down. With that, the last train began to shimmer and fade, the figures on the platform waving goodbye. Lily felt a sense of peace wash over her as she stepped back onto the train. When she returned to her seat, the man sat beside her, the train starting to move again. You've made the right choice, he said. Remember, it's never too late to embrace life and open your heart to new possibilities. As the train glided smoothly along the tracks, Lily felt the weight of her past lift. The darkness that had once consumed her now seemed a distant memory. The train continued to travel through the night, carrying her toward a brighter future. Finally, the train slowed to a stop and the man turned to her, his expression proud. This is your station. You've arrived at the beginning of your new journey. With a grateful smile, Lily stepped off the train, her heart lighter than it had been in years. As she turned to look back, 
The ghostly locomotive vanished into the night, leaving behind only a whisper of hope and the promise of a fresh start. From that day forward, Lily carried the lessons she learned aboard the last train. She embraced her past, learned to forgive herself, and opened her heart to new beginnings. The weight of regret no longer held her captive. She was finally free.